Hi, everybody. It is absolutely thrilling to be here tonight. And thank you for joining us. And thank you for inviting us to your amazing community. We have been hearing so much about FAN. It's almost made us want to move to Chicago, frankly. Um, what a community resource and how lucky sure. you are all to have it. We want to thank Lonnie Stonich for that wonderful um, introduction and for bringing us to your community. We want to thank Fan and everyone here tonight. And we also want to thank Nutrier High School and the Bookstall and all the amazing sponsors who we just met. So that was all very, very exciting. Um, we're here tonight to talk about one of the most challenging questions that face parents of teenagers in 2019. How do we walk that fine line, which sometimes feels no bigger than a balance beam, between supporting our teens and doing too much? How do we parent without over-parenting? How do we support our teens, create independent young adults, and keep our families close? So we're here tonight to talk to you about this. This is one of the most important questions for us. Um, but before we tackle that question, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about us, a little bit more than, than uh, Lonnie just told you, and a little bit about Grown and Flown. Um, we were not parenting experts. We are not physicians or psychologists or educators. Um, we, a few years ago, could not have told you much more about parenting than what we had learned from the five children in our two families. Quite frankly, we had read what to expect when you're expecting, and we had winged it from there. So we, um, these are, these are our families. Um, this is us when we thought we were at the most difficult stage of parenting. <laughs> Does this look like your families by any chance? Anybody have these pictures? Y'all remember those days? Mary Dell couldn't babies. even get her contact lenses in. And my husband took that picture. Obviously, I didn't even know. Um, these children are all in their 20s now, by the way. These are the years when parenting was its most difficult. These look like Instagram photographs. These look like something you'd put on your Facebook with hashtag blessed. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> this is when parenting is absolutely its hardest, uh, no joke. Um, so despite, um, despite what the pictures show, there is a very different picture. Parenting during the teen years is the most challenging. Not only do we feel the most insecure in our parenting, we are the most stressed during these years. We start the book um, with stories of our own lives. We tell the stories of our two families and some, some fallible incidents. Maridel starts uh, by telling the story of a haircut that her son got. It was both unfortunate and unattractive, and she lost the plot. She had forgotten the number one cardinal rule of parenting teens, which is it's only hair. <laughs> Um, I had to confess to a time in which my family, there was one more boy born. Oh, you, you could probably see down here. So there were three boys uh, by the time we were done. I had to confess to a story where my family was eating dinner around a round pedestal table. And if anybody has multiple boys in their family, I don't know if your kids fought sort of aggressively. One stood up, smacked the other across the head, as you do at the dinner table, and pushed the entire table over. So now all the cutlery, the dishes, the plates, the centerpiece are a pile of debris on the floor with our dinners. Don't forget the hamburgers. The hamburgers, they're in yeah. there. Everything's in there, the big pile. Um, so we were obviously forced to leave the, the restaurant in a very embarrassing moment. <laughs> yeah. So. When you have three boys, this is an unattractive and undesirable, but not unimaginable possibility. Um, so this was not a shining moment in our household. And the reason we tell these stories and the reason we publicly embarrass our children is because we didn't want our readers to get to chapter one. We didn't want you to get out of the Roman numeral pages to the chapter one without thinking that we had been there, that we knew how challenging this was, that we know how confusing and how difficult the parenting teens can be. So for the past seven years, we have been listening to tens of thousands, and at this point, probably hundreds of thousands of parents tell us what concerns them, what scares them, what delights them, and what inspires them. We lead an online community of 130,000 parents in a Facebook group. Is anybody here in Grown and Flown Parents? Yes. Oh, we love that. Oh Thank God. you. We're so happy to see you all. Um, it's fantastic to see you here. We have 130,000 parents who every day are interacting and discussing what the challenges that they face in this stage of parenting. In addition, as Lonnie mentioned, we have a website with um, 500 experts and writers 
and we get millions of page views every month and we listen to that community as well. We have our ear to the ground and it has humbled us in our approach to parenting. Definitely. Exactly. Um, but in this time, we have learned three truths. The first is every family wants exactly the same thing. We all want our kids to be happy. That's the cardinalist rule. We all want to raise independent adults and we all want to re remain close as a family. Number two, we're all gonna get there in entirely different ways. The path to those three things, happy kids, independent adults, close families, is different for every family. And finally, we all fear giving, not giving our kid every opportunity to reach their potential, and we fear giving them too much and destroying that potential. So as parents of teens, you know now that you're in the toughest years, but I wanna talk a little bit about what researchers have found. Multiple studies have shown that the early years are not the most challenging. In fact, we are most comfortable and most secure in our parenting when we have babies and when we have grown children. During the middle school years, our parent self-efficacy, this is what research, this is the word researchers use for it, our parent self-efficacy, which is our confidence in our own parenting is at its lowest. It begins to decline in middle school and it's, it's low through the teen years. These are the years where we feel most out of our depth. These are the years when we understand that our children are making consequential decisions on the direction of their lives and we feel adrift. So that's why we chose to start the community. That's why the community has grown. You know, it's, it's been baffling to us. Uh, Facebook tells us that our community is one of the most active on the entire platform. And it's been baffling to us why that happened. And we think in part, it's because so many issues that we're facing, we feel as though we're facing alone. And when you reach out into a large community like that, you quickly find other parents, and any of you who are in the Facebook group have probably seen this, you quickly find other parents in other parts of the country who are having the exact same experience you are. It's both comforting, it's informing, it's inspiring, and it makes us feel less alone and more secure in our parenting. We're doing a little dosy do here tonight, so yep. hopefully, hopefully you'll humor us a little bit. So Lisa and I think that these are not only the most confusing years of parenting, these teen years, but it can also feel the loneliness, as Lisa just talked about in our Facebook group every day. And if, and if you're not in it, we want to invite you to become members. If you're on Facebook, if you're a parent of a teen or a college student or a middle school and you're in that ballpark age group, please come join us because every day we hear this big sigh of relief this digital sigh of relief as parents realize they're not the only ones facing problems that they thought perhaps their child was experiencing and maybe nobody else was but one of the reasons why it feels so lonely to be the parent of a teen is your experts tend to abandon you you no longer go into the pediatrician's office with your teenager you don't have the same kind of parent teacher conferences that you did and the same relationship that you may have with your excuse me, your beloved elementary school teacher. Um, and really, your student should be the one interacting with coaches and teachers, not you. So you feel like all of a sudden, you're in, the, you're in the background of your teen's life. And sometimes our real life community abandons us as well. Remember play dates? Those don't happen anymore. There's no more chit-chatting in the pickup and drop-off lines once your, once your kid starts to drive or takes public transportation. So all those spontaneous moments where you may have chatted with a teacher or chatted with friends just kind of evaporates. The teen years are a time when we need our experts and we need our community more than ever. When our kids were little, we may have felt supported by friends or by experts. But now it feels like we're doing the hardest stage of parenting and we're kind of doing it alone. So we begin the book with a story and some of you may have read the book, which we thank you so much if you bought it and hope that you'll be interested in, in checking it out tonight if not. But we start the story with a, with a woman named Janet who's faced with a really difficult parenting situation, um, one that she obviously never thought she would face. Um, she reached out to us when her husband was diagnosed with stage four cancer, and simultaneously, she had on her mind taking her oldest daughter to college, something she'd also never experienced before. Those of you who have, who have taken your eldest to school, you know how overwhelming that experience is, so you can imagine how you would just feel shell-shocked, I think, if you had just gotten this tragic diagnosis. 
So she wrote to us, she said, and she didn't know us. We, at that time, we really didn't have a Facebook group. If this, was, this was sort of the genesis of, the, of us starting this community. So she writes, my concern is my daughter and getting her off to a good and mentally sound start. I couldn't find anything online. Then I thought of you. I want her to go and be excited and happy about her new start without having to worry about her father. It's a pipe dream, she knew. But I'm hoping to get her as close to that as possible. My first thought is to reach out to the college to find a person, the person, to be a contact. I don't want to have to call and explain everything five times before I get her some support. Any advice, suggestions, or resources you could provide would be most welcome. She wanted her daughter to have the best possible start as she left home for college, but she knew she had to do more than support her other than just getting the twin Excel sheets. So Lisa and I had no personal advice at all. We couldn't just pass off platitudes of comfort to her. She needed more. So we did something for the very first time that's actually caught on in our group in a most amazing way. We posted her question anonymously to protect her privacy, and the group was absolutely amazing. Hundreds of suggestions came in from people who had had this experience or knew someone in this experience, from college administrators, people who said, I've been in those shoes, I know what to do, I work for a college. So, the, so our community lifted and guided her, and she realized, you know, she learned things that could be really helpful. She found the person on, on the campus to support her daughter, who was there for her when the time came, um, when her husband did pass away around Christmas time of her daughter's freshman year. But since then, there have been thousands and thousands, literally, of people who've come to us with the questions that keep them up at night, their most profound parenting problems, and what they found is they're far from the only one who's had this experience. Hundreds of people respond to every single question saying, I was in, the, I was in your shoes, this is what I did, this may be an idea for you, and it becomes an opportunity for really creative parenting, which we can all use. So if we had one personal advice to give it to you tonight, one big takeaway, it's don't go it alone. Find resources. Community, like this wonderful fan community, experts, if they're in real life or online or on books, to help make, you make sense of these confounding years of parenting. Sorry for the back and forth, but we, we, we have so much we both want to tell you. So there are, um, there we go. There are four things we want to cover with you tonight. Um, and here's, I just want to give you a brief outline and then we'll go through them all with uh, a little more time. The first thing we want to talk about, one of the reasons that we're all so confused at this moment in time, one of the reasons we're asking the question, how do we parent without overparenting, is because the relationship between us and our teens is so fundamentally different than the relationship we had with our own parents. You may be feeling this in your homes. We're gonna to talk to you about what the data shows. There has been a seismic change in the way teens and young adults relate to their parents. We actually think it's pretty good, um, but it explains some of the confusion that we're all having. We're gonna discuss what we think of the helicopter parent phenomenon. Um, parents in our generation get a really bad name. There are a lot of things that were called, do I have them? No, I'm gonna go, I'll, I'll show you the pictures later. Um, we're, we're called a lot of mechanical names, as it turns out. Um, and we're wondering whether this is an overblown story, something that the media has written a lot about, or is there a lot of data to back it up? So we're gonna to touch on that with you as well. From listening to all the experts that we deal with and all the parents that we talk to every day, we've put together four tools that we feel that you can hold on to in your parenting. These are four questions you can continue to ask yourself that will guide you when you're wondering, when you're, when you're balancing on that narrow strip of balance beam and thinking, should I be helping more or should I be backing off here and letting my kid figure this out themselves? And finally, we're gonna look at some of the most important things that we think Parents need to teach kids while they're still living at home. We see lots of lists online, I'm sure you see them. By 17, your kid needs to do this. By 18, your kid needs to do that. Yet most of the skills that we see on these lists can be learned on YouTube. 
I don't know about you, my kids are really, really good about watching YouTube. I do not teach, need to teach them anything they can watch a video for. So we hope to offer you some of the profound skills that we think are best taught by parents in our homes during the teen years that will help our kids in their autonomous life going forward. So why is it so hard to figure out how to guide teens but not overparent them? Do you think any of our parents ever asked this question once? No, no, probably not. That's because there's been a fundamental change in the way teens and young adults relate to their parents. The shift has been nothing left than seismic, and it has left parents, you and us, feeling confused and unable to really draw on your own teen experiences as a guide to how to parent your own offspring. So studies of the relationship between teens and young adults and parents show nothing less than a seismic shift in terms of the way teens and college kids relate to us and our relationship they wanna have with us. So I'm gonna talk about three different pieces of research, briefly touch on each one to show you where all the data is leading. The first is something that a very large survey that the AARP did where they asked young adults and their parents to comment on how they behaved with each other versus the parents thinking back about when they were teens. So what the survey found echoed what we're seeing all around us. 62% of today's young adults communicate with their parents at least once a day. I don't know if you all are finding that in your own households. 62% versus 41% of the parents when they were teens. They're happy to confide in us. They wanna talk about their careers, their financial lives, and their social lives. Now, when we were young adults, it was not uncommon for daughters to talk about these things with their parents, but we have found that gender gap. The research has found that that gender gap has really disappeared, and young men are also interested in confiding with their parents. Um, you know, now marry this with the fact that all of us have a, in, our, in the palms of our hands at almost every moment, a tool that lets us communicate that much closer. It's easy to see how this connectivity is a bigger part of their lives and ours. It's cheaper to call than it was 30 years ago. Certainly we understand that. But the rest of the survey, and cell phones of course didn't exist, but the rest of the survey goes beyond just technology. It talks about what could be technologically driven data. Our kids socialize more with us. 60% of 20-somethings saw their parents socially once a week versus 42% a generation ago. They want to spend much more time with us than we really wanted to spend with our parents at their age. And this probably will not surprise you one bit, but that closeness and that relationship is also financial. From the 1970s to the 1990s, parents spent most of their money on the teen years. But since 2000, parents across the economic strata have spent the most money on children under the age six, and that could be expensive childcare or housing, or on their young adult children over the age of 18, which is, of course, college. So what should we make of this closeness between parents and teens? Is it a good thing, or does this benefit our kids, or is this the dangerous overparenting that the media is talking about? This is a case where the intuitive answer and the data really come together. Last month in the Wall Street, Jenny, Law uh, Jenny Wallace, a freelance journalist, wrote about a second study. The researchers in the study showed that helicoptering, and we hate to use that term, but that's, we might as well face the fact that that's what, that's what we've all, our attention is drawn to, that term. Helicoptering is not the problem, but rather if the parent was controlling or supportive. They found that parents, and I want to read these great, um, this great line, parents who were both supportive of their kids' independence and responsive to their needs had more positive outcomes, this is the good part, such as better academic engagement, less delinquent behavior, and lower levels of depression compared with young adults whose parents were either uninvolved or too controlling. Then finally, the third study we want to talk on, it was um, conducted by Dr. Karen Fingerman, who's a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. You can see what her, um, her you know, results led to. She said that the support, though, that she's alluding to ranged from room and board, to making a car available, to simply being available to talk to your son or your daughter. So we think this research is really compelling. 
Our relationship with our teens is fundamentally different than the one we had with our parents. But far, far from harming kids, studies make clear that kids benefit from a supportive and warm um, env home environment with parents who are not controlling. I want to tell you a story that we have in our book that really illustrates this point, I think, um, in a very powerful way. And I was with, on the book tour, I was in Atlanta last week with the author, Tracy Hargan, and got to meet her for the first time. She and her husband both came. She tells the story of her teenage son, Will, who was a junior in high school at the time, a seemingly happy kid. Her office was right across the hall from his bedroom, and she could often hear him laughing with friends, doing his, you know, she knew he was, you know, on it with his homework. He was watching very- Watching YouTube. Watching YouTube. You know, yes, that's right. She did say laughing at YouTube videos. Anyway, but like a really seemingly well-adjusted kid, had friends, you know, this was not a problem child in her view. But one day he came to her and said, Mom, can we talk? And when he told her that he was depressed, her first instinct was to say, you can't be depressed. You're, you don't look like you're depressed. How can this be? But in Tracy's words, what she said, what I didn't know in that moment was teenage depression shows itself differently. It can manifest in numbness, apathy, no feeling at all for anything, a darkness they don't understand, even if outwardly they seem okay. So Tracy was haunted by the knowledge of a friend whose son, also seemingly enjoying his life, had recently committed suicide. It is something that we are all touched by and acutely aware of. Will had come to his parents at the urging of a teacher, another trusted adult in his life. But because Tracy and Will were so close, because she had created, along with her husband, this atmosphere at home that made him feel comfortable being open and honest, she was able to get him the help he needed. So this open line of communication is a blessing in our lives, especially when things are going well. But when things are going not so well, it can be a lifeline. When our kids are struggling, it allows us to advise them on how to get the help that they need. In good times, it's one of the true joys of our lives. Okay. Um, we want to talk a little bit about helicopter parenting. Um, so it's a term that we hear all the time. Um, I'm sure you see the headlines all the time. Do, where do I have the headlines? Here we go. Here we go. Here's some of the headlines for you. Helicopter parenting, it's worse than you think. Helicopter parents stir up anxiety and depression. Here we go. There's, there's lots of them. We're about to get to my favorite. Helicopter parents are raising unemployable children. <laughs> Makes everybody feel really good, right? Uh, it will be an entire generation that's not, it's unemployable. So these are just, we literally searched the term helicopter parents and these are like the first eight that came up. We hear it all the time. We hear the anecdotes all the time. We hear the stories all the time. There is almost no data on how many parents are helicopter parents. There is almost nothing that we can find or point to, and we've even asked Lisa Damore. We've asked experts everywhere. We, we know that there has been a change in behavior. We know that the relationship, as Mary Dell just described, is entirely different than the relationship that we have with our parents, but there is almost nothing to say how many parents are helicopter parents. So I wanna go back and talk a little bit about, ooh, that's the only way to do it, I guess. I want to go a little back, back a little bit and talk about our kids. Um, the helicopter parenting basically is an implication that we're doing a terrible job, that we're not raising our kids the way we were raised, and that we're somehow lacking in our parenting. And we find that that's not the case. So let me just ask you guys, how many of you remember being in high school and your parents had no idea where you were, no idea what you were doing, you were off, exactly, exactly. Keep them up for a second if you remember talking to your parents once a week when you were in college, once a week. So you're 18 years old, you talk to your parents 10, 15 minutes a week, okay, that's most of you. Um, if your parents are like my parents, when you had that 15 minute call, they spent five of it reminding you how expensive long distance calls were. <laughs> just remember thinking, yeah, but if we stop talking about how expensive it is, we could so talk more. Basically, it was a 10-minute check-in. Right, with an, eight, with an 18-year-old. So that became kind of the gold standard for us. That became, in our minds, the way parents behaved. Hands off, we don't know where they are. 18 years old, you're on your own. 
And we judge our own parenting by the standard of the parenting we were raised with. And this, we think, is where some of the helicopter parenting notion is coming from. We are much closer to our kids, our relationship is entirely different, and we feel slightly uncomfortable with that. So I want to talk a little bit about your kids and ours. During our childhood, our parents didn't help us apply to college. They didn't get us SAT tutors. They didn't even give us avocado toast. <laughs> we all grew up, we, came, we became adults, and somehow we believe now that that worked out. But our kids, I'm gonna make the case, are actually doing a lot better than we were. We're gonna look at this on the metrics of three of the most traditional metrics for measuring teenagers, sex, drugs, and alcohol. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about their views on education and their views on our community at large. Um, we'll start with alcohol. Um, the good news is, and I want you to hold this thought long after you've left here, you are raising one of the most open-minded, accepting, and best behaved generations. So let's look at the data. The New York Times recently reported earlier this year that today's teenagers drink far less than their parents' generation, that would be us. 7% of eighth graders in 1991 and 31% of 12th graders in 1991 had been drunk already. By 2018, those numbers had dropped precipitously, and now only 2% of eighth graders have been drunk and 17% of 12th graders. Most importantly, for both their health and their safety, the rates of binge drinking had dropped. As you probably know, this is the most dangerous drinking the kids do. This is what we worry about most. This is the most damaging to their young brains. This is the most da dangerous in terms of accidents sexual assault, everything. Now, we're not arguing that binge drinking is gone and that it's not a problem and a very real problem in college, but even on college campuses, kids are drinking less in this generation than they did in ours. This is the rate of cigarette smoking over the last 22 years. It's absolutely collapsed during that period. Our kids use fewer drugs of every kind except for marijuana, and you know, with it becoming legal in some places and somewhat legal in the, I think the, the data around marijuana is going to be difficult to track over time. They have fewer car accidents. They have fewer physical fights. Teens and young adults even wear their seatbelts more. It may be that there's that beeping sound that we didn't have when we were kids. I feel like you could die when someone doesn't wear their seatbelt. But it may be just that we modeled some great behavior, that we got in the car every day and did it, so they got in the car at day and every did it. This is not to say that our kids don't face some risks. Vaping is up. Sexting is up although neither of those were things open to our generation. Today's teens are less likely to have had sex, and if they have had sex, they are likely to have had fewer partners and to use birth control more. To give you the data just to look at, in 1991, 62% of juniors in high school had had sex. That number has dropped to 42%, from 62 in 1991 to 42% today, according to the CDC. Now, Despite, let's gonna to touch on one other aspect of it, despite the hue and cry about the hookup culture, uh, and I want you to hear that with air quotes every time you hear that word, hookup culture, um, this is yet what we believe to be an overblown myth. There's research done recently out of the Harvard School of Graduate School of Education. They surveyed 2,000 college students and gave them a choice. It's Friday night, what would you like to do? It's kind of an open-ended thing with lots of choices, and the choices were, do be by myself, go out with a group of friends, go on a date, have sex in a meaningful long-term relationship. Um, they gave have them- Have sex with a stranger. Have sex with a stranger was one of the choices. So they gave them a list of choices of what you could do on a Saturday night. 84% of the kids chose an activity that did not involve casual sex. Overwhelmingly, that was the choice. Although, as you can see from this quote, this is from Richard Weisbord, who's the uh, lead researcher on the study. That is not what most people think, and that is not what most teenagers think, but that is what the data bears out. There are other behaviors that should give yourself, give yourself pause to pat yourself on the back. Your teens are less likely to drop out of high school. They're more likely to finish college. Gen Z looks like they will be the most educated generation in history, and they're only eclipsing the generation before them, which are millennials. They are one of the most embracing, open-minded generations who celebrate the diversity in our country and see it as an asset to our nation. 
So in our observation, we also see a lot less drunk driving. Have you ever talked to your kids about drinking and driving? You probably all have. I assume you're gonna all nod your heads here. I don't know if your kids say to you what my kids say to me. Mom, it's your generation that drinks and drives. I see it happening all the time. Adults go to restaurants and they get in the car. He said, we have Uber, we have Lyft, we don't do it. The data bears this out. So my kids slap my hand and it turns out the data is right. The rate of drunk driving has decreased by half since 1991. Overall, the evidence is our kids engage in far fewer risky behaviors, which is obviously a highly desirable outcome. But we think this contradicts the myth that somehow we have ruined a generation with our overparenting. So now we want to turn towards that dreaded phrase, helicopter parenting. So here's those headlines that we showed you earlier. Part of what makes it difficult to get the balance of, of parenting right is that we are besieged every day by this notion that we are overparenting. But helicopter parents are the parents that demand special treatment for their kids, who march into the high schools and try and tell teachers what to do. They're the parents who tell the coaches what position their kids need to play. And more recently, of course, in the news we've all seen, they're the ones who pick the college of their, cho their choice for their children and then pay their, their way into it. Most parents are not doing anything like this. Even though we are told they are all around us and it's an epidemic, that is not what the, bear, uh, the data bears out. So one of the problems we think with helicopter parenting is that we are very quick to judge other parents' behavior. Lonnie brought this up this afternoon. We're very quick to judge what somebody else does. In our Facebook group, there are 130,000 members, as Mary Dell mentioned, and there is often extremely spirited conversation <laughs> about tracking apps. One of our moderators, Carolyn, is here today, and she can vouch for this. Parents have very strong feelings about tracking their kids. You, you know what I'm talking about, the ones in their phone, and you can tell where they are. The conversation is often um, focused on whether or not we should track the kids after they've gone to college. So there's, there's debate about whether we should track them in high school, but there's really debate about they're an adult, they've gone to college, do you still track your kid? There are arguments on both sides of the equation. I have to say, personally, I think I come down on the side of 18 college turning the tracking app, up, app off, though I will admit I would find that very difficult to do. So one day, um, a mom comes into the group, and the, the, group, the conversation has gone really heated. And by heated, I mean like 700, 800, 900 comments. It's, it's blowing up. The moderators are in there trying to keep people from um, name calling. Maybe. Name calling, yeah. Um, and she comes in and she says, My son has type 1 diabetes. And he has lived at home until he was 18 years old. And he has had us as backup for helping to manage his condition. He is now living on his own for the first time. And for some period of time, I need to know every morning he's up and moving around and that things are fine. I don't want to call him every day. I don't want to text him every day. I don't want to hover in that way. But I just need to know that he is managing something for the first time in his life. When you hear a story like that, it makes you step back for a second. First of all, you think to yourself, you never know the story behind the story. So whatever we see on the face of anything, you never know the story behind the story. But the second thing you start to think to yourself is, she would, by all accounts, be called a helicopter parent. There would be name calling, there would be finger pointing, but her story is different and she has reasons and every family has stories and every family has reasons and nothing is the same for all of us. So I think it's really important that we always understand that, that these gross generalizations really don't work for everybody. Um, so we looked long and hard for data on how many parents are helicopter parents because we figured if we're all being impacted by this notion, if we are all in the back of our minds thinking, ooh, don't want to be helicopter parent, shouldn't do that, or ooh, is that helicopter parenting, we should know how prevalent this is. There is almost no data to tell you. The one thing we did find was, again, a recent survey, and you can see it's from the New York Times, where they asked parents whether they did a certain, certain activity. So they had a long list of activities and asked parents if they did them. So it turns out 84% of parents of, um, this was 18 to 28 year olds, right? It was 18 to 28 year olds. 84% of 18 to 28 year olds make doctors and dentist appointments for their kids. So I got real judgy in the moment and thought, God, those people. 
And then I realized I had literally made dentist appointments for two of my kids that week, not one, but two. Reminding myself to stop judging and that maybe, you know what, the reason I made an appointment, and this maybe you, some of you understand this, was because there was no way to do it online. If my kids could have done it online, they could have, but because you're shaking your head, because they had to make a phone call, mom, can you do it for me? Please do it for me. Um, so I had made dentist appointments for two of my kids. The next, one of the next questions they had asked was, how many parents had um, talked to their kids about their romantic life? Something about their, you know, a breakup, a, things going well, not going well. And it was 42% of parents. So this was them pointing out, mm, helicopter parents, 42% of parents talked to their kids about their romantic life. Again, we stepped back and thought, when we were 20 years old and something was going wrong in a relationship, when we were 20 years old and thought, is this person for me? Is this person nice? Is this the way it's supposed to be? I don't like the way this feels. Or, oh my God, this is amazing. This is gonna last the rest of my life. This is perfect. We would talk to another 20 year old who knew no more than we did, nothing. When we had a summer job and it was going badly and we thought our boss hated us and we didn't ever think that you know we were gonna get hired back again, we would ask another 19 year old who had been working three months also, so they had great advice. That's not what our kids are doing. When our kids are having problems, confusion, when our kids are seeking advice, they are asking us. We have been married for 25 years. We have worked for 30 years. We know the things that our kids need to find out. We are apprenticing adults in our homes. So the things that they described as helicopter parenting, we began to wonder whether they were truly helicopter parenting. Down towards the bottom of the list, there were these, and I don't, I don't know if they're easily read. Helped with an essay or a school assignment, 11%. Contact an employer, 11%. Wrote all or part of an essay. Is that doing too much? Probably is, yeah. I think contacting a professor, pretty much, and doing your kid's schoolwork, probably a problem. But here's the thing, and this is not the conclusion that was drawn in this article. This is about, let's call this 10% of parents, 11%, 4%, 8%. This is about 10% of parents who are really stepping over a line that many of us might think is doing too much. That means the 90% of us are not doing these things. It means 90% of us probably aren't helicoptering. 90% of us, when our kids come to us and say, I don't know what to major and I have no idea, we're not on the phone to their advisor saying, why haven't you talked to them and figured it out? We sit down and think, what do you like best? What classes have really been important to you? What have you enjoyed? And we start that conversation with them. So we think it's really important to focus on the 90%. The headline would have to be, the vast majority of parents are not helicoptering, and we don't think that's a likely he headline, but we think that's probably the truth. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So, we think that actually, as parents, we're not doing a terrible job, even if we are being Sorry. told that we're one of these mechanical machines. You can take your choice. Um, we were thinking maybe the drone might be the most recent one, but there it is, the helicopter one. Um, our kids are doing better than we, than we thought, but still every day we need to make judgments about how much we should be involved in their lives. I think that's a kind of a given with almost every stage of parenting, how much you should push your kid and how much you should sort of back off. But it becomes very pronounced in the teen years. But what we've learned is that the closeness in our families can be a very good thing. We can remain a positive influence on our teens' lives even after they go to college. We cite another study in the book where um, fr college freshmen who talked to their parents at college um, ended up consuming less alcohol and, and binge drinking less. Not that they talked to their parents about alcohol consumption, but just because they had that touch in, that, that, that reminder of their family and their family values. So we think that's a really great beneficial um, opportunity for parents to continue to stay an influence, positive influence in their lives. So just because you talk to your teen often or have a very close relationship does not mean that they can't take care of themselves. Just because you, they ask you to listen to their um, problems or ask you to help them with a decision doesn't mean they can't make one. Adulthood is a process of being apprenticed. And honestly, who better than us 
to help apprentice our kids. So we're gonna talk about four tools that you can use, hopefully starting immediately with your kids, that will help you figure out where you are in this lean back, lean in dilemma. The first one is, am I teaching an adulting skill? So how many of you all have had the opportunity to help teach your kids to drive? Great, then you'll know what I'm talking about. And for those of you who haven't yet, I wish you luck. <laughs> so when you're teaching your teen to drive, you are in the passenger seat, right? Your teen is there, you're giving them counsel, don't go too fast, don't get that close to the car in front of you, come to a complete stop, right? Those are some of the fundamental things. You would only grab the wheel if you thought a crash was imminent. This is teaching an adulting skill. We are not gonna drive the car for our teens by holding the wheel. That doesn't teach them a thing, right? So think about that. Use that as a metaphor and a visual image. Am I teaching them an adulting skill or am I trying to drive by holding the wheel? Is my teen making forward progress? So the one thing I used to love when my kids were little, I mean little, is going into the pediatrician's office and you get to have them weighed and measured and their you know, heads measured. You would talk about if they were sitting up, if they were walking, if they were talking, all those important milestones. Well, we all know that teens mature at different rates. So the milestones for teen life really just don't exist. One thing that we, that we also have in the book that I think is really interesting is an interview um, with Dr. Frances Jensen, who's a preeminent brain surgeon, and she gives a whole background in how the teenage brain just isn't developed and what's great about it and what's also sort of scary about it. But that's one of the big reasons why milestones for teens are not that clear line. So it's really important though, if, your teen, if you can see that your teen is making forward progress in maturation. So let me tell you another story from the book. One of our favorite um, authors or type of authors are high school English teachers. Anybody here teach high school? Do we have any teachers here? Thank you. Good to see you. And write for us. And please write for us. One excellent thing about um, English teachers in particular is when they send us a draft, there is not a comma out of place. These are fabulous. So Laurie Stratton is one, it has taught AP English in high school for many years. So she um, has written in the book a great story about what she wants parents to know from the view of a high school English teacher. But the story I'm about to tell you is a personal one, very personal. Two weeks before her son, this is her oldest child, before her son graduated from high school, he announces he's not going to college. He has a place, he's enrolled. Deposit down, financial aid package, scholarships, it's a done deal. She says, smiling his dashingly handsome grin, he said he was tired of school and wanted to see what the world had to offer. Laurie, AP English teacher, well-educated, master's degree, is horrified. She's devastated, embarrassed, and really confused. She said she felt cheated because since attending a four-year college after high school is the path to success, the path she and her husband took and what she assumed all three kids would take. Later that fall, he's living at home, he's working, and she runs into a friend at the grocery store. Well, my children know that isn't an option for them. They will be going to college, is what the friend announces. So this was a turning point for Laurie. She realized that she had to stop seeing his decision as a reflection on her and start seeing the decision for what it is or what it was, her son searching for what was right for him. She recalled the line from the kite runner, children aren't coloring books. You don't get to fill them in with your favorite colors. So fast forward a year or two. He struggled to pay the rent sometimes. He was in jobs he couldn't stand, waiting to get a job that he liked better but he decided to go back to school. He worked at night, he started college, he married, he and his wife bought a house. He's getting his education degree in two years. He volunteers in his community and she honestly can't remember the last time he asked for money. This was not the success story or the forward progress story that she thought, but it sure was, it certainly was, and she acknowledged that. So is your child making forward progress? in the way that's significant for them. Maybe not in your definition, but what is important to him or her. The third point, am I moving into a mentoring role? The goal here is fewer edicts 
and more suggestions, even if you have to bite your tongue all along the way. Less imposing of your way of doing things and more giving advice when it's solicited. Again, think about the car and the passenger seat. Think at some point, can you be sitting in the passenger seat looking at emails while your child is driving? The question you can ask yourself, am I solving the problem for them or am I teaching it to him or her to solve it themselves? We know what the answer should be. And the last thing is, okay, I want you all to think of something. Think of a niece, a nephew, your teen's best friend who you're very close to, or think of maybe the neighborhood kid that you've seen grown up from basically the time he came home from the hospital. You've got this person in mind. This is someone you know, a young, a young a teen or a young adult, but not your child. They come to you and they say, you know what, I need some help with my college admissions essay. I can't figure out what to talk about. Would you help me kick around some ideas? Your answer is, of course, you'd be delighted to help. If your child came to you with that same request, the answer should be, yes, of course you'll help them. That's not helicoptering. If you would do something for a friend's son or daughter or niece or nephew, why wouldn't you do that for your own child? Say that teen has a problem with the boss and they are flummoxed. They don't know what to do. They've never had a conflict with an adult before. They want to sit with you and see if that maybe you could help them come up with what to do. You would sit with them and help them maybe draft an email or come up with some ideas for role playing. You would do that same thing for your own child, right? You love this young adult in your life. You love your child to the end of the earth. So the important thing though is to know you would not write that person's college essay. You would not call that person's boss. If you can somehow uncomplicate your own emotions with your, with your you know, uh, flesh and blood and think of this as being a, a person you also care about but just not your child, it might be easier for you to determine if this is something you should do to help your kid. Um, during the crone and flown years, our role is evolving into one of mentorship, confidant, and advisor. We're here to talk less and listen more. If your nephew had a problem, you would listen. If he asked you for your advice, you would offer suggestions. While obviously the relationship with your own child is going to be emotionally closer and more complicated, if you would do something for someone else's teen, you're probably not over-parenting to do it for your own. So we hope those are helpful. We find that if you use those three, four, sorry, if we use those four questions or guideposts, um, that answers a lot of questions. When we, when, we, when we can't decide which side of the parenting over parenting um, dividing line we're on, we find when we refer to these four questions, it's extremely, extremely helpful. Um, so we want to go on to some essential skills we think our kids need to establish their own autonomy. Um, these are the essential skills that they can't learn on YouTube. Often we see lists of things that kids need to do. And I promise you, if your kid can't figure out how to roast a chicken, they will call you. When they can't figure out how to renew their driver's license, they will call you. They will not be able to remember their social security number, they will call you. So these are the questions that they cannot call us for. These are the questions that they need to develop in themselves. These are the skills they need to develop in themselves while they're still living at home with us to take out in the world. First one. Can your teen cope with hard feelings? So this is when our kids have a big disappointment, a big setback. They've had a terrible grade on, a, on an exam. They've been dumped by a love interest. They have had a close friend sort of snub them and they're not, this is one we see a lot in the group. Right. They're snubbed and they're not in a friend group anymore. This, that's actually one of the most painful things that we see the kids go through. Do they know how to cope with those hard feelings by turning on music, grabbing a coffee with a friend, having a cry? or do they gravitate towards weed or alcohol? They need to learn how they can best manage those bad feelings on their own, and this is something we can help them learn at home. Second, can they handle their own problems? This is with or without talking to us. When they come to us, are they saying, solve the problem for me, or are they saying, listen to me talk? It's super, super important that they've moved from the stage where they are asking us to do something for them, as they did when they were quite small, 
too often just asking us to listen to them. A kid who is just asking to listen or venting or looking for advice is a kid who's moving towards independence. Third, can your teen take full responsibility for self-care? Um, this is one of the stumbling blocks we find kids have in college. They struggle to regulate their eating, their sleeping, their studying. Exercise. Exercise. They struggle to regulate their downtime. Freshman year is so exciting that they just go 24 seven and then they get mono, mono. They always get mono. They, seem they to always get, get mono. mono, always. It's always mono. Um, can they regulate their playing of video games, their use of alcohol? I have a child who literally flipped day and night. So the video gaming was going on all day long, sorry, all night long, and he was sleeping all day long. So that he had almost turned the 24 hours during freshman year in college. This is unhealthy on so many levels, including personal hygiene, and um, obviously wrecks havoc with your circadian rhythm and with your moods, because he was never seeing any daylight. They need to learn to engage in self-care and self-control is an aspect of self-care, controlling their use of alcohol, controlling how they spend their time. So again, skills that we are going to try and work on with them when they're still home that they're gonna to need to take out into their independent lives. Can they manage their team, sorry, their time? Um, one of the number one problems we hear every day from parents is not that their freshman or their sophomore in college is struggling with the work, they're struggling with managing the work. So because in high school their time was so highly regulated, class, then class, then class, then sports, then activity, then home, then study, and then lights went out in our houses, they really never learned to manage their time. It's extremely difficult skill to teach. It involves a lot of forward thinking, which is a frontal lobe problem that not all of them are ready for. But we can model this by showing them how we manage our own time in the way that we almost spoke to them when they were tiny, when we used to you know, do something and almost narrate what we were doing, sometimes we need to think out loud and say, you know, I'm doing this today because I know by the weekend we need to do X, Y, and Z, and I've got a big thing at work the week after, and we're going on a long weekend. Almost talk to them how an adult thinks through time management, because this is one of the number one problems that causes them to struggle in, in college. Do they know how and when to seek help? This can be academic help, this can be medical help, this could be mental health, any kind of help. Do they know when they're out of their depth and they need to call in somebody who has a specialized knowledge and knows more than they do? It may just be going to the TA. Often kids who've done very well in high school have not had to seek out a lot of academic help. They get to college, college is more challenging as we all remember, and they literally don't know how to seek help. Um, so can they learn how and when to seek help and how to do that in the best way for them? Two more. Can they take responsibility for their own poor decisions? We expect them to show poor judgment. The reason high schoolers, listen, high schoolers are just as big as we are. Like they could and should be able to live on their own. They have such poor judgment, they have to stay with us. <laughs> they, the number of stupid things they do means they have to stay with us until they're 18. But here's the thing, when they misbehave, when they show poor judgment, when it's uncovered, do they own up to their behavior and change it? Or do they point fingers and say, it wasn't me? Um, there's a wonderful piece in the book that was submitted anonymously. Um, a mom was in the emergency room with her son. This is, this is every parent's worst nightmare. You get a call from somebody in the emergency room. Your kid is there. They've drunk too much. They're not conscious. It's frightening. It's horrifying. I, I sat on a board of a hospital for many years. It's remarkably common. Um, so the question here isn't whether this, and she talks about it in great detail and all the problems, and she gives us a lot of things you need to think about with your kids going to the hospital. But the question is, when the kid comes to, what is their reaction? Is the reaction, oh my God, I can't believe I did this. I'm embarrassed. I've used all these medical resources. There's all these nurses and doctors around me, and I brought this on myself. I've worried my parents to death, and this is absolutely horrifying and they change their relationship with alcohol, or do they somehow try and blame somebody else, or do they do it again? So can, has your teen shown that they can take responsibility and learn from their own poor decisions? A kid who does that is getting ready to become an adult. A kid who does that 
is moving towards that stage of their lives. And finally, one of the most important things, can your kids assess risk? Our teens face so much more risk than they did as young children. They face risk, as we've just mentioned, with alcohol, with drugs. They face risk behind the wheel of a car every moment they're driving. That's why it's so scary. Um, Lisa Damore, who we, we've mentioned earlier, and who is a good friend of ours, psychologist and an expert on teen girls, says the way we need to look at this is by asking two questions. Are they moving from the notion is what are the chances I could get caught, and that's the way a 14 or 15 year old thinks, to what could go wrong if I do this? They need to be making that transition from Am I gonna get caught driving 90 miles an hour? What are the chances either the cops or my parents are gonna take my license to? If I drive 90 miles an hour, what could go wrong? Hmm. Kids who've made that transition are moving towards autonomy, and that's an important stage that they need to get to. So finally, we want to end where we began. These are the toughest years of parenting and all parents need community and support to get them through. We know it's a super stressful time. It's stressful for your kids. They're, they're unbelievably busy. And honestly, we know how busy you guys are as well, which is why we're so appreciative that you took your time out tonight to come and join us. We truly believe that the relationship that we all are going to have with our teens and young adults is going to be one that is closer than we may have had with our own parents. The relationship we have with our adult kids is the longest one we will have with them. I am so lucky to have my 92-year-old mom in my life still. My relationship with her has spanned four decades. That's double the amount of time I lived under roof. Those next years of adult to adult really deserve our attention. The important thing to remember is that this level of contact and closeness should not be confused with overparenting. Overparenting is intrusive that says to our kids we don't trust them to do things on their own. Close parenting is how we apprentice teens and help mentor them into adulthood. We love this quote with Dr. Ken Ginsberg, who I know has visited Fan before. Um, ultimately, we want exactly what he's saying, interdependence, knowing that nothing is more meaningful or makes us happier and more successful than being surrounded by those we love. We think you're doing an incredible job. Lisa and I want to thank you for inviting us into your fan community tonight, and we're so grateful for you taking the time to join us. We hope that you'll reach out to Grown and Flown and consider us a go-to source for parenting advice. Thank you so much, and we look forward to talking to you after this is over. Thank you.